Welcome. Thank you all for joining us this evening. I'm David Hughes, Executive Director of the Menzies Research Centre. I'd like to acknowledge John Anderson, Nick Greiner, former Premier of New South Wales, and I think from our State Parliament here we also have Rachel Merton and uh, Alastair Henschkins. We've also got two of our great directors at the Menzies Research Centre here, uh, Paul Espy and Christy McSweeney. She's the loudest person in the room, so no doubt you'll um, hear from her later. <laughs> Apart from you, Rhonda. Uh, tonight we're launching our Centre for Youth Policy, which will be led by Frey Leach. I met Frey during my first week on the job some four months ago. During that discussion, we talked about the antagonistic and nihilistic culture emerging amongst her generation, a culture that creates victimhood and fuels depression. But Frey responded with optimism and hope for the future. She sees a pathway that empowers young people, a pathway born of liberal values and faith in the individual and our fellow man rather than the current culture of distrust. I agree, and I offered Freya a job on the spot in our first meeting. <laughs> Still to this date, the best decision I've made in the job. For too long, Conservatives have favoured experience over youth and enthusiasm. But I value both equally. And in Freya, I see a young woman who's more resilient, knowledgeable and grounded than most 50-year-olds. Through our Centre for Youth Policy, we will have young Australians working for other young Australians. And I'm delighted that we're joined by so many young people here tonight. I won't in interfere with Freya's work. Um, her work will be grounded in her strong liberal values. She's ambitious, but it's an ambition for her own generation above and ahead any personal ambition that she has. I'd also like to thank John Anderson for joining us this evening. John shares a passion for empowering the next generation. Many of you are here tonight because you've been inspired by John's work. John's approach cuts through those populist distractions. He's teaching young Australians to question the world we live in rather than just accept this divisive culture. We are distrustful and tribalised. It's no wonder we've seen increasing rates of depression amongst our younger generation. The premise of much of John's recent work is that we can only truly understand these challenges if we first understand ourselves. We seek to cancel anyone we don't agree with. We don't create a better world in this way. Instead, we need to acknowledge that there's good and bad in every one of us. It's not attached to our mere <coughs> identity, culture, class or race. In this way, John's work encourages, encourages us all to develop our own belief systems, to equip us to understand the personal and political challenges that we may face. John, I can't over, overstate the positive impact that your work's having. That's why we're so delighted that you're joining us this evening. Tonight, we'll hear from Freya and then we'll hear from John and then John and Freya are going to treat us to a mini podcast-like discussion uh, <laughs> about Freya's work and the challenges ahead. So please join me in wel welcoming Freya to the podium. <laughs> And thank you, David, for your incredible leadership at the Menzies Research Centre. Over these last few months, your mentorship and guidance has been truly wonderful and it's a privilege to get to work with you. Our mission here at the Centre for the Youth Policy is to reach every young Australian with a liberal message and our liberal values, those being freedom and aspiration and to then support the Liberal Party to create policy that is rooted in those values, but that speaks to the challenges facing young Australians today. It's no secret that young people aren't voting for us. Of the 45 electorates with the highest proportion of young people between the age of 18 and 29, we hold just five of them. And my, people my age, so I'm 20 years old, <laughs> are more likely to vote for the Greens than they are for the Coalition. And the problem is that this challenge is only going to get more acute. As more Gen Z and young people like myself turn 18 and are eligible to vote, and more of our older citizens pass on, that's estimated to create about a 2% swing to left-wing parties every election cycle. So it's only going to get worse. And even more concerningly, the old adage that people get more conservative as they get older seems to be breaking down. Millennials and Gen Z are actually 
abandoning the Liberal Party as they get older, rather than moving towards it. So at this rate, it's quite a bleak picture. And if this trend continues, it will be catastrophic for our party. And ultimately, with no legitimate opposition from the right, left-wing governments will become the natural state of play and our country will certainly be worse for it. But there are three key reasons young people aren't voting for us. And our mission here at the Centre for Youth Policy is to address each of those. The first one is our liberal values, our message of freedom and aspiration. Young people don't get it. We live in a culture right now that is defined by victimhood and identity politics. And what that means is 58% of young Australians have a favourable view of socialism. It's, it's absolutely, it's beyond comprehension for us. And the challenge is the modern liberal project thus far has been defined by a desire to discard those old arbitrary identities that we inherited. There shouldn't be a difference between people based on gender, based on race, based on things we don't control. But what's happened now is the left has resurrected all of those things and that the key cultural battles that are gripping young people are defined by them. The voice is a war against white colonizers. Climate change is a war against greedy capitalists. Me too is a war against men. And the rental crisis is a war against baby boomers. This new form of identity politics is reducing young people and all people to the very things we fought against as a liberal democracy for the last 50 years. And what that's doing is it's creating a culture of victimhood where young people don't feel free because you're defined by things you never chose. And if you're not free, you can never be aspirational. So at a fundamental values level, young people don't get our message. And then the problem is as well, they don't see our values of freedom and aspiration born out in policies that speak to them. There really hasn't been a concerted effort by the coalition to generate policies and really implement them. Policies that deal with the issues that young people are facing today. And what's worse is we've actually been come to, see, to be seen as a party of vested interests defined by our protection of baby boomers which is absolutely ridiculous because we're a party that believes in getting governments out of the way so everybody can succeed and everybody can determine the direction of their own life. We're not the party of vested interests, but that's how young people have come to see us. And the third challenge we're facing is that young people aren't hearing our message through the channels that they engage with. The majority of young people they don't form their political opinions based on dinner table conversations with their parents. They're probably not even eating dinner with their parents. They're scrolling through TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and they're listening to influencers talk about political issues, and that's how they're forming their opinions. Now, the problem is those influencers all happen to be very left-wing. In fact, Friendly Geordies, who has over 250 million views on YouTube, lots of you here know him, uh, and millions of subscribers, and really concerningly, he's got a Facebook group with 100,000 young Australians that he can communicate with instantaneously. That is very hard to combat. But he has actually been funded by the unions since 2016. They've been playing this digital game. Social media really is the new frontier of the political battle. The problem is the left has realised that since the mid-2010s and we're only just switching on. So we've got a lot of work to do in catching up, but I believe it is possible because there's a hunger out there among young people for a different story, a better story not one that tells them that they're victims, their life is hopeless, and they have no freedom to change it. And that's where the Centre for Youth Policy comes in. 
We are working to address all of these three problems. We are working to communicate our values through social media. We're generating policy ideas that are meeting the needs of young people. We're looking at things like higher education reform. How can we hold universities accountable for the results they produce in their students and not just use universities as a way to extend childhood or, or use international student fees to fund obscure research? We're looking at things like increasing housing supply through planning reform and cultivating self-reliance in the next generation of Australians in our schools so that by the time they enter the adult world, they understand that not only can they take responsibility for themselves, but they have, a, they have the power to actually improve their own lives. That's a message that they're not hearing right now. And finally, we're building a following and a movement of young Australians on social media, on TikTok and on Instagram. I recently posted a series of TikToks of me talking about The Voice and they've received over a million views. Wow. So it is possible. <laughs> Thank you. But this is just the start. And those TikToks took me about five minutes to make per video. 15 minutes total to reach one million young people. 60% of my audience is female 80% are under the age of 24, and 95% are Australian. That is what we need to be doing more of, and that is our mission here. So if you like what we're talking about, if you want to be part of building up, of mentoring, of guiding the next generation of young Australian leaders, and making sure that our values of freedom and aspiration of conservatism, classical liberalism, and pragmatism are passed on to my generation, our future leaders, then please support our work here because we can't do it without you. There is a generation of young people out there that are hungry for this message. They are hungry for it. They are looking at our content. They are reading what we're producing, but we need to do more. And that's why the Center for Youth Policy exists. Now, it's a great honor for me to introduce our special guest this evening, John Anderson. John spent 19 years in federal parliament, six of those as deputy prime minister in the reformist Howard government. Through fiscal restraint and broad-based tax reform, you guys managed to deliver 10 budget surpluses in 12 years of government. GDP grew at 3.6% per year. Household income doubled. Two million jobs were created. And the number of apprentices in training grew by two and a half fold. That is absolutely incredible. And yeah, I'm baffled. I mean, I wasn't actually born at that time, but, <laughs> but uh, I, I've read all the books and it's genuinely inspiring. <laughs> when John Anderson <laughs> was talking, when John Howard, sorry, was talking about John Anderson, he said, I have not met a person with greater integrity in public life. And those of us today who are here who know John Anderson could not agree more wholeheartedly with that statement. John is the model of a thoughtful, generous and values-driven leader. And since leaving Parliament, John's contribution to public life has remained profound. He now hosts a podcast called Conversations with John Anderson. His podcast has 380,000 subscribers on YouTube and has amassed over 89 million views across his videos. That's on YouTube alone. And his podcast is sweeping through the social media world, platforms like TikTok and Instagram. And I have countless friends that have been inspired and moved by the things you talk about in your podcasts. You truly are reaching a whole new audience and bringing conservative and liberal ideas to my generation, which is really profound. And I think what's also worth noting is John's desire to see young people and particularly young men succeed and make a contribution to our country is unmatched. And it speaks of your generosity and selflessness, the interest you take in building up the next generation of Australians. 
So without further ado, thank you, John Anderson. Try it, thank you. It was worth it just for the kids. <laughs> but it's great to be with you. Thank you to David Hughes. Uh, do you mind if I just call out a couple of others? Nick Griner. Uh, we've known one another for probably a few more years than you or I would want to admit to. May I call out one of my former guests, uh, Professor Salvador Babanis from the University of Sydney. Uh, can I uh, mention Mark and Margot Leach? Mark, I'm so glad your daughter takes after your wife. <laughs> uh, but friends, it is a great honour to be with you. It really is. Freya said one thing I'd just like to uh, make a very brief remark about when she said that uh, I'm keen to encourage young men. Uh, I'm keen to encourage all young people. Yeah. And I would never use that term, be a mentor, because I think that sounds a bit like I'm on myself. I just want to be a sounding board, mm -hmm. that's all. Uh, and the, the one comment I'd make about that is, I just have the impression that we live in an age, you mentioned victimhood culture, um, the empathy culture idea, it's, I think, if young ladies sometimes feel discouraged, I think young men probably feel even more discouraged. Oh. I watched Jordan Peterson the first time I met him and the chats were town hall. And he stood up and he said, don't think an empathy culture is going to solve your problems. And I thought, what does he mean by empathy culture? And then it dawned on me as I looked up there an audience packed with young men, that an empathy culture is a victimhood culture where everyone is either a victim, real or perceived, or a victim maker, and overwhelmingly it's our young men who are told that their masculinity is toxic and they are the victim makers. This is, uh, these things are the tip of a very ugly iceberg. Uh, some of you heard me say that I think we're at a civilizational moment. We've inverted everything that we once regarded as good and true and honest and trustworthy and elevated almost everything that we once would have thought of as divisive uh, and backward looking rather than forward looking. And there's a sense in which I would make the observation that one of the ways in which Parliament has changed so much since the time I went in in 1989 was that in those days, most of the people who provided, if I can put it this way, the thought leadership for their political teams, regardless of which team it was, did so through the lens of a worldview. So the, I don't know whether I'm brave enough to say it in this world, but the old noble socialists, you know, their objectives were noble anyway. I mean, uh, their um, <laughs> policy prescriptions were dreadful. Uh, but they would look at every policy issue that came up through the lens of what sort of Australia do I want, and they could tell you what sort of Australia they believed in. And the classic liberals, ditto. They would look at the policy issues of the day against what sort of Australia they believed in, and they could tell you what it was. Uh, and ditto the conservatives. All of that is gone. And it's gone and left in its wake the thing the Australian people dislike so much mere managerialism and opportunism in the face of the lack of vision and a capacity to set out an idea of what sort of Australia you believe in so that you can argue to the death the ideas that the others are putting up with and what goes with the idea of that you abandon the idea of debating the ideas is of course uh, the respect for one another that is the key to a real debate. I have to say, I, it's just occurred to me, Nick, that um, your Deputy Premier was a man called Wal Murray. Wal was a man of the soil from northwest New South Wales. Uh, um, I enveloped him in only one sense. It was electorally. <laughs> My electorate was bigger than his because it was a state electorate. Some of you might remember that Wal was one of the biggest men ever to have um, appeared in public in Australia. Uh, and he was uh, six foot seven and a slow bowler as a young man like a beanpole. But as he got involved in public life, the beanpole bit slowly started to. 
And after a couple of years in the parliament, and, uh, you know, wanting to win an election to be deputy prime minister beside Nick Griner, he and his wife uh, decided that he ought to go on a diet. So we're talking 1970, 1987 or 88. So uh, Daff, his wife, was sent off to town to the chemist shop in Moree. Have you heard the story, Nick? You haven't heard it? Oh, beauty. Um, <laughs> to buy a pair of scales. So she came back with the scales, and they were newfangled ones that had a liquid crystal display, not a dial. So Wall gets on them, and he's 23 stone. <laughs> right, this is our starting point. He'd go off down to Sydney, uh, you know, and he'd walk the stairs, and he'd cut back to one breakfast, because he you love two breakfasts. I used to stay in motels, and he'd order two. Uh, and uh, he'd come home on a Thursday night, or whenever it was, the State Parliament got up, and he'd get back to Moree on the stone. Six sales, 23 stone. This went on for about three or four months, and eventually one day Dash said, this is ridiculous. You say you're taking the diet seriously. I am taking it seriously. Look, I pulled my belt in two, two notches. There's something wrong with the scales. Take them back to the chemist. So she took him back to the scales. <laughs> oh, dear, said the, the salesman. I'm terribly sorry, Mrs Murray, but these scales stop at 23 stone. <laughs> <laughs> But let's assume you can define leadership. It's an interesting <laughs> test. What is leadership? What's a definition, a workable template for leadership? If you ask a bunch of school kids, because uh, it's always an interesting thing to do, what's leadership? They immediately go to the qualities of leadership without defining what it is. I think the most useful workman like, because I'm from the bush, I know I don't look like it in a seat. Honestly, I'm a split personality. I go, I go home and I'm in working clothes. They say, come on, I can't see you in a suit. And I come down here and they say, you're not a farmer. I am a farmer. Well, I'm a farm labourer. I, labor. I work to my son and daughter-in-law now and they work me very hard for no pay. Uh, but um, Henry Ford II came up with a cutting block definition of leadership that I quite like. He was the grandson of a car maker and a surprisingly thoughtful man. And a kid asked him one day, what's leadership? And he said in his American, his Detroit drawl, he said, well, he said, a leader has about him or herself three essential qualities, the capacity to set a vision, you know, an idea of what needs to be done at whatever the level the leadership is, is at. The sporting club, we're not training hard enough, we've got to work harder at our tackling and get ourselves fitter, right through to the national level. Uh, we need to reform the economy because it's not meeting our needs, it's not fit for purpose. Whatever it is, you've got to have a vision. The second element of leadership is the capacity to articulate the vision to others. And the third is that you must have about you the qualities that will inspire others to work with you to achieve that vision. What might those qualities be? I would just list very briefly three. The first is conviction. You've got to believe in something. One of the reasons that we're so disengaged in politics is that we've deduced that most of our leaders don't believe in a damn thing except themselves. Sorry to say it, but you see it everywhere. You really do. And the Australian people, they smell a rat straight away. They get authenticity. And without authenticity, they won't respond. So you need a worldview to the young amongst you as you contemplate uh, a life in public service. What is it that c makes up your worldview? You all have one. You all have one. I have a friend who's prepared a manual for young people entering the military, young Australians. Uh, what is your worldview? And that many of them will start by saying, what is a worldview? Well, it's the way you see the world. And then you start to probe. What do you think? Do you believe in such a thing as truth? Do you think it's worth pursuing truth? What is your value? How do you integrate with other people? What sort of world do you want to live in? I have to tell you, he says, it's pretty despairing because most young people, you reach the point where actually they're not sure that they're really interested in anything except themselves. And in the military you think, well, are they going to go and make sacrifices for others? What's your worldview? You need conviction and you will take people with you if you can convince them that you've got a vision worth following and you can articulate what that vision is and why it matters. You need courage. No leader worth their salt is a shrinking violet. You really have to be able to stand up 
and passionately defend what it is that you believe in. And a little line that we coined for a speech I gave in Canberra, it's always great when you see these things quoted somewhere in the newspaper. The only answer to cancel uh, culture is courage culture. And I know it's tough in a day and an age when you can be so easily cancelled on social media for young people. You know, we used to dread the thud of the newspaper coming over the back garden fence. Uh, I, that didn't quite happen out where I live, it'd get there about three days late. But you'd still dread it and you'd open up the paper to see what they were saying about you. Now it's instant. Or a slight slip or an opportunity for a protagonist to pull you down and there it is. And it's been so abused, let's have a little sympathy for young people. The research in America shows, and it wouldn't be very different here, that young people have given up on free speech. They'll now say, no, we shouldn't have free speech, we should have appropriate speech. Well, of course, that's incredibly dangerous. Who decides what's an appropriate speech? But we need to be honest with ourselves. Why? So many people have used free speech irresponsibly, particularly with the anonymity of the keyboard, to destroy and to pull down. And so many other people have been hurt by this. They're by saying, there's got to be some restraint. And if people won't exercise restraint, you end up having to devise laws and to police it. That's why we now have this unholy architecture, starting with Whitlam back in the 70s, uh, of anti-discrimination laws and so forth in Australia. Stop and think about the illogicality of the reality that we now compete with our fellow Australians for our rights. That's a nonsense. It's infinitely inferior to the old days where you just treated your neighbour with respect and did unto them as you'd have them do unto you. You know, and then we replaced that with the idea of tolerance. Well, that's a virtue, but a pretty weak one. And now it's gone, and we're into a new age of absolutism where if you dare to disagree with me, I'll cancel you. Well, we've got to rise above that. Uh, and as I heard someone say the other day, in the end, they can only cancel you once. <laughs> Suck it up for a couple of weeks and life moves on. Uh, and I think the, uh, the other thing that I would say, though, the third C, is conscience. We need to be people of conscience. We need to genuinely care. Now why do I mention that? I mention it because there's a sense in which in the massive change in attitudes in the West, and they are massive, you can track them quite easily, um, uh, the idea has emerged that the greatest virtue is autonomy. It's self. Every man's an island. That is proving to be a disaster for the people who soak it up. As Roger Scruton pointed out, it's immediately dismissed if you stop and think that from the moment of birth, people inconvenienced themselves and made way for us, made sacrifices for us, did things for us that we couldn't do for ourselves. Now, in our middle years, it might be reversed for a while. In our later years, it'll swing back and we're dependent upon others. We are interdependent. And the idea that we can live on our own is producing, I think, an epidemic of loneliness, of anxiety, of depression, of self-harm. I mean, Mr Progressive, how's it really going? <laughs> tell us how it's working out. Happy are we? And all the research tells us we're not. I, I find, I have, uh, my youngest daughter's a school teacher and she wouldn't mind me saying this, she's been absolutely rocked by three suicides of young people in her country community over the last month. Three. In this land of opportunity. All of them fit capable people who appear to have the world at their feet. Selfishness as a way of life is not working out for us individually, but it's also destroying our corporate life. Freya mentioned identity politics. David mentioned atomization. We focus all the time now on the things that divide us, not the things that unite us as Australians. I mean, good grief. In case you hadn't noticed, we have enough external threats without tearing ourselves apart from within. So in the face of all of that, can I just say, as a non-lib, uh, it's a very deep honour to be with you tonight. I'm absolutely delighted that you're new. Oh, I've got a fellow, Sam Berry from Scone. <laughs> Good to see you, mate. Yeah. yeah, now listen, when you're up with the devil, you need a long spoon, okay? Otherwise, no, no, no I, don't, I don't mean that. Uh, many of my very best friends are liberals, um, and uh, they really are. <laughs> Some of my worst enemies are gnats. But anyway. <laughs> so, uh, I remember uh, Ian Sinclair saying to me one day, uh, 
and he said, uh, I, I was talking about uh, the opposition, um, and he said, now listen, you need to, <laughs> you need to get it right. Uh, he said, um, the, the enemies, that mob over on the other side of the house, uh, he said, uh, the opposition are the people, <laughs> half the people behind you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so politics is a tough game. But I, I just want to finish by saying this. Leadership is critical. No one would dispute that. Leadership at its most basic means you move someone else to do something they would not otherwise have done. We all exercise leadership at some point in our life in some way, but we all, if I can make this point, desperately need good, strong leadership of our community and our nation. And our children really are our future. And nothing brings me greater joy than to say to the younger people here, all power to your right arm, I'm right with you, as long as you have a comprehensive and coherent worldview, you're about other people, not yourself, uh, and you've got courage, conviction and conscience. All the best to you.